Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace, and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayers in prayer daily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and this week I'm honored to have on the show someone who I was recently introduced to through former podcast guest and child abuse activist, Amy Peffer. Introducing to you today, human trafficking, mind control programming, and Freemason survivor, mother, wife, soon-to-be author, and absolute inspiration and joy, Faye Russell. Faye was born into a multi-generational Freemasonic cult family and was an amnesic to the horrific abuses being perpetrated against her by her immediate family, the Freemasons, and high-level military and government growing up. Like many other survivors you've heard on this show if you've been following along, Faye's conscious mind believed she grew up in a mostly normal and loving family, and it wasn't until after marriage and becoming a mother that she began to recall the harrowing and horrific memories about the truth of her family and upbringing that began at birth. It's impossible for those on the outside looking in to comprehend what happens in these cult families and even more difficult for the general public to conceive. But it's imperative we call out and expose all perpetrators and learn about the darkness in the world so we know who our enemies are and how to defend ourselves and especially defend our children against them. Faye so beautifully says that through healing with Jesus, she no longer carries or has to express the heavy emotions that accompany her story, but that you will see her get emotional when she speaks about the glory and healing Jesus has brought her. At 76 years young, Faye is the ultimate story of redemption, and I'm so proud of her for choosing now to be the time where she shares her story in an effort to shine a light on what is hidden from the public within secret societies such as the Freemasons. Faye's story is riveting and horrific, and yet you can't help but be in awe at the woman she is today, what she's been able to overcome, and the courage and conviction she speaks with. It's an inspiration for us all to see what's on the other side of healing and to get to experience the creativity of how personal Jesus is with the healing of every individual who calls upon him. I ask that you give Faye your full attention, as you'll be one of the first to have the honor of hearing her story. I also suggest grabbing a pen and paper because you're going to learn so many of the things that you may not have heard before. So you guys, without further ado, please help me in welcoming this week's guest, woman of God, child abuse activist, survivor, warrior, overcomer, and walking miracle, the one and only Faye Russell. Faye, thank you so much for being here with me today. Wow, that was an amazing introduction. I need for you to help me finish my book. I would love to. You're, you're a great writer. Oh, you're so sweet. That's one of my favorite things about this show is doing those intros because I know, yeah. especially survivors, like you weren't told these wonderful things about yourself growing up, you know, and it's like, it is time yeah. for you to hear how wonderful you are. So I love getting to make those for you. Yeah, um, that was great. <laughs> I appreciate you coming on here with me today. Your story blew me away when I heard it on Michelle's channel. And I was so grateful that Amy introduced us so I could share your story with my audience. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to you. Um, where would you like to start with your story? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for letting me be on here. And just to hopefully anybody who watches this, who's experienced any kind of trauma, and if they feel hopeless in it or uh, feel like they're in a deep, dark tunnel like I did at first, that there is hope. And it is through God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to encourage them to, to find out what that's about if they don't know. 
<laughs> That's beautiful. That's one of my favorite things too about talking to people like you and Lisa and even Amy who works with survivors is mm -hmm. I, I get to meet God. I get to meet Jesus in so many different ways through all of you. And it's, it's amazing. So I'm, you know, I'm very inspired by all the healing that you've done and, and so proud of you for being courageous enough to share your story. Okay. Well, I'll start when I was 29 years old. And I, I had um, that really, I guess, selective amnesia. I only remembered the good things. I didn't, I, you know, there were a couple of bad memories, but mostly I had created this loving, wonderful family. And that's the family that I lived in, even though I actually didn't live in that kind of family. But at 29 years old, our son, John, um, he uh, wanted a dog for his birthday. He, he was turning six and he wanted a, uh, a dog for his birthday. And I had always had a, a, I don't know if it was fear or just a, a repulsion against having an animal. I, I, I didn't like animals. I didn't like to be around them. And I just thought that was normal. So I find, you know, but of course with your kids, your love for them will overcome any fears or anxieties that you have about things. And so my sister said, Faye, let me get John. I, I tend not to say names. <laughs> I'm going to have to be careful here. <laughs> uh, it, you know, let, let me get him a, uh, a dog for his birthday. And so I agreed. And the, as soon as we brought that, that dog into our home, I started having horrible fears. I started having flashes of pictures of my mother doing things, uh, of that I was going to hurt my children and how I was going to hurt them. Uh, I had horrible fear because Satan was busy in my heart and mind telling me that I was going to become mentally ill, just like my mother. And my mother was in a, a mental institution and lived there for the rest of her life. And, uh, and he, he said, you know, you're going to end up being just like your mom. And so I just started memorizing scriptures, crying out to God. I knew that he was my only hope. And that, how my journey started of remembering what happened to me from actually in the womb and especially at birth because the reason getting a dog triggered that is because of the animal sacrifices that I had to do so that you know that was the truth um from 29 to 52 years of of age I had a gradual healing um, and only remembered uh, the abuse at home. My mother sexually abused me and my sister and um, uh, lots of emotional abuse, physical abuse, but even ritual abuse. She would do rituals with me after she would sexually abuse me to atone for my sins. Uh, I'd have to sacrifice the animals. We always had plenty of rabbits in our backyard. We had, um, you know, little rabbit coops. So there was always a, a rabbit available to sacrifice, to atone, put on a cross and atone for my sins. So from, uh, you know, it was just one horrific memory after another from 29 to 52. I was in traditional counseling with psychologists uh, during that time. I didn't really experience any healing under that type of counseling, but it helped me to be able to talk and process. And that's very important too, uh, as part of the healing process. One of the biggest parts of my healing process is my, now this is when I'll cry, <laughs> is my husband. We've been married um, 56 years. Congratulations. <laughs> and um, uh, he unconditionally loved me. And people who have been traumatized like this, that is 
one of the biggest healing powers is having people that love you. And so he showed me what God is really like, not the, the, uh, you know, what I was programmed to believe in my heart about. And, um, so, uh, during my, during this period of time of being in traditional counseling, I, I would see in my mind this hallway and there were doors all along the hallway. And then every once in a while, a door would open and I could see myself at three years old, little cotton top, blonde, little girl with a nightgown, a white nightgown on. And she would peek out the door at me. Well, in the 80s, there was a lot written about the inner child so that I thought that's what that was you know an inner child but as I tell my story it ended up that it was a uh, an altar that I had been created to help me deal with what was happening to me so that I could function throughout the day and I'll explain that more but anyway up until 52 that was the only introduction I had to my precious uh, little girl parts that I call my heroes. They are my heroes because they helped me to survive. But now I'm going to kind of revert back <laughs> to when I was born. And um, I was born into a home where my dad was a, um, a Freemason uh, my grandfather, who nobody knew was my grandfather, except my dad and my mother knew, um, maybe some other people, you know, but but the the grandfather that lived with my grandmother was not the the biological father of my dad. Um, I truly believe that this man, who is the biological grandfather, deliberately uh, had a child with my grandmother to program in Freemasonry. Um, I believe my dad was programmed from birth. I don't have any proof of that. It's just a strong belief that I have in my heart because of the way our lives were. And uh, this man was a doctor. He was a physician. My grandmother uh, earned money, uh, especially b b well before the depression, because my dad was uh, my dad was uh, oh I lost you. Um, my dad uh, somebody's calling me, and I I got distracted. Emma, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I couldn't okay. see anything. I could still hear you. So it's it didn't impact the video at all. Okay. Uh, but anyway, my grandmother made money by uh, prostituting herself and my aunt, my dad's sister. And this is, you know, how my dad's birth came about. Now, my mother is the one that told me this after I was an, an adult that you know this that this man was my grandfather and so you know my dad when i start talking about the the ritual abuse and the freemasonry and the trauma based mind control he he did he he was like in a a trance and he just wasn't like the dad that i knew at home so I'm not even aware, I don't even know if he was aware of what he was doing when all that was going on. But anyway, it started. Your dad was very loving at home, right? Uh, yes, he was. He was a very kind, gentle man. Not affectionate and hugging, you know, but you felt loved. I, I felt loved by both of my parents. Uh, and that helped me be able to keep my my capacity up 
uh, I know I've heard people talk about if you have a very low joy capacity growing up where you're nurtured and that nurturing like eye contact with the mother fills up that joy capacity where when you get to be an adult, you, you can handle things better. You're not as, you know, prone to a lot of problems that a lot of people have if they don't have that nurturing. So, I mean, I, you know, my memories are that I got that, but I got a lot of other stuff along with it. So, um, my first memory is being in my crib uh, between three months and six months old. I'm not really sure. It could have been as, as early as three months. But in, um, in therapy, I've also had uh, memories in the womb where things were uh, being spoken over me. And uh, because God has the ability, the Holy Spirit has the ability to show you these, these things that, you know, even happen in the womb. So, you know, it, the trauma also started in the womb. But um, so six months old is the first memory. And that was my mother sexually abusing me. That it wasn't about. Freemasonry. It was about my mother uh, abusing me. So that is just what I, I, you know, dealt with for, um, I don't know, from 29 to about 47. And then when I was at 47, I got the book um, Hope for the Wounded Heart by Dan Allender. And there was a chapter in there that said, that talked about that sometimes with your abuser and the parent that doesn't protect you from the abuser, which would be both my parents and when one, that it might be necessary to discontinue contact and relationship with them until you heal. So I went to Western State Mental Hospital told my mother that I was remembering her abusing me and um, and that I wasn't going to be, that I loved her, but I would not be able to see her until I got further in my the healing process. And uh, she was upset, uh, but she didn't deny it. She just said, you're making me cry. But my mother had had two frontal lobotomies uh, where they were trying to uh, control anger and because she, you know, she was so abusive and uh, it didn't, it didn't work, but it did make her uh, not remember things and, um, and it affected her physically for where she couldn't function as well. That, but anyway, so. Was that so, part of the abuse or did she get that done in say a hospital or Formal a hospital. A okay. phys phys physicians knew that she was violent at home. Mm -hmm. Now they would tell me and my sister that it was to control pain, but I, I learned later it wasn't to control pain. It was because they were trying to get, keep her from being so violent. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever really protected us, you know, in all that. So then on down the road, I started remembering my dad. I only have one memory of him sexually abusing me at home. And that really blew my mind because I had always seen him as my safe place, my protector. So, you know, I, I had no idea that my dad was involved in anything. So I, I, I did the same process with him, with my psychologist, and I used Dr. Allender's book, uh, a chapter on bold love, and it takes you through steps of how to talk to the parent, give them the opportunity to repent and get into counseling with you and, and getting into, you know, admitting what they'd done. Well, you know, my dad didn't seem to have any memory of anything happening. And so I had to dis discontinue relationship with him also. Well, once I, I stopped seeing my parents, I got freedom from depression. I had had really deep depression 
up into then. And when I walked out of that counselor's office, it, it was like a bird, like let, let out of a cage. And so I want your, the, I'm not telling people who are watching this that you need to do that, but I'm saying it's okay. If you need to stop having contact in relationship with your abuser or even people that are someone in, that lived in the home that didn't protect you, I want you to know that is a good, healthy thing to do. Because, uh, you know, uh, you get emotionally attached in such an unhealthy way. And that's a difficult thing to do is to separate yourself from your parents. So then at, um, you know, mainly that's what happened between 29 and 52 was just one horrific memory after another of mother, you know, sexually abusing me, then the rituals, sacrificing things, doing other things to atone for my sins. And then at 52 um, years old, that's when I started remembering uh, the Freemasonry, what happened in Freemasonry. And uh, the reason I started remembering that is because at my church, because um, they all these years, I am seeking God in all this. I'm doing by, I am studying God's word. I'm memorizing scripture. I'm praying. I'm doing, I'm going to Christian counselors. I'm doing everything I can to heal from this. And uh, I went, but at 52 years old, I went to a Beth Moore conference, uh, not conference, Bible study at my church. And it was uh, breaking free breaking free from strongholds, you know, that have had a hold on you or, or emotional pain or whatever it is. And she said, she said, you know, when you go home, just imagine yourself sitting in God's lap and him just holding you and loving you. And I was really looking forward to doing that because she's had such a passionate love for God that it just really impressed me. And I wanted that. And uh, because I knew God loved me in my head, but I couldn't feel it in my heart. And when I would ask people at, at church about it, they couldn't either. They thought that was normal. <laughs> I mean, that's how the church stopped. You believe it in your head. You don't, you don't go on your feelings. And I saw her going on her feelings and her head. So I really liked that. So I went home and I, and I imagined my, I just went into a time of prayer Imagine myself sitting in God's lap, but this God started sexually abusing me. And that's when I, I thought, oh my word, what is wrong? That was worse than me remembering my mother sexually abusing, thinking about God. Sex, I mean, I knew God wouldn't do that, but I didn't know why I was, you know, thinking that. And so I, um, I found someone who knew how to do theophastic inner healing prayer. And that's where once I started getting into uh, uh, inner healing prayer is where whatever uh, struggle you're going through, whatever mainly feeling you're having, negative feelings that you're having, then we pray for Jesus to take us back to the first memory that we uh, we felt like that, the first time we felt like that, or if it's a, a lie belief, the first time you started believing that. And that's when I started remembering being um, abused in Freemasonry. It took some time, um, but the all of a sudden one in one of the sessions, I saw myself in Washington, D.C. with a lot of military people, government people in the uh, rotundra, in the Capitol building. And um, and then they, it was, you know, they started sexually abusing me. And um, so that kind of blew my mind. And I was very angry. Uh, I wanted to expose them to um, uh, to the 
FBI, police, whatever. I wanted to go to court. I wanted to bring them to court. But people who are adults and 52 years old can't do that because you don't have any proof. So now I get to expose them on, on shows like yours, Emma. And I thank God for that. It's taken years to get here, but I'm, I'm so thankful. And God told me when I was so angry that one day he would have me expose it to thousands of people. So I think over, over 20,000 have viewed Michelle's podcast. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Yeah. And it's climbing. <laughs> And so that, pro, you know, that prophetic word from the Lord has come through, uh, you know, in the past couple of weeks through Michelle and you, and then I'll be on uh, Lisa's um, show next week. Um, now I'll just talk about the programming. Um, Would you is that where you want me to go next or is there a yeah, Something. let's talk about that. If you could talk a little bit more about Washington, what do you remember from Washington? Oh, when I was trafficked to Washington. My first memory, okay, in the rotundra, they took me from the rotundra in the Capitol building to uh, the White House. And then I saw myself in a bedroom in the White House. And that memory was that Dwight Eisenhower was uh, sexually abusing me. Now, when I say, and I'm going to get a little detailed to you, or I hope this isn't offensive, um, they didn't have sex like um, adults do, because they didn't want to, they tried their best not to break your hymen. So it was partial, but mostly oral. Um, so it, you know, lots of, touching me having to do things to them them doing things to me but not full-blown intercourse you know because they didn't want to they they wanted me to appear to be a virgin every time somebody had sex with me I even have memories of them making a mistake breaking the hymen and then they would have doctors that would create a hymen that would take me a long time to get over. I would be in the bed for days or weeks in horrible pain as a little girl, as early as, you know, three, four, five years old. So they, you know, they have their ways of doing this, but they would try not to, you know, uh, go that far. Um, now, I think at this time, Eisenhower was chief of staff in the White House. He wasn't the president yet. Now, my next, now as a teenager, and I don't know how many times I was taken there. You know, I, God didn't, he, he was so merciful. He didn't show me all the memories, just enough for me to be set free from whatever, you know, happened. Because if that was the first memory and that got healed, then all the other memories with Eisenhower would be healed. And without me having to go through all of them. God has a miraculous ways of of, of doing things like that. Um, I, oh, I do remember... Mamie Eisenhower coming in and and us doing some sexual things, but she looked like she had been drugged. I, I, do, I don't know if the woman even knew what was happening, but I do have a memory of her. Um, but I, I just don't think she was aware of what was going on. Um, then as a teenager, um, I have memories of John Kennedy uh, mainly in the uh, swimming pool in the basement, the indoor swimming pool. And Marilyn Monroe was in some of my memories. And of course, there's, I mean, it is known that she was a presidential model. Um, and uh, she was very sweet and kind. Um, I always felt like she talked like a little girl because I, I, I mean, it's, 
you know, it is written that she was also DID, dissociative dis, uh, identity disorder, and had her sweet little heroes that helped her function in life. But she, you know, she just real sweet, like a, a little girl. And and uh, Kennedy was very mean to her. Uh, he 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 just was mean uh, emotionally. Um, he would say things like, I mean, you know, Marilyn Monroe, oh my goodness, what a body. <laughs> I'm a little 14, 15 year old girl and I am not very voluptuous. <laughs> I'm very thin <laughs> and I definitely don't have what she has. And he was, you know, I prefer this kind of body over yours. I prefer these innocent uh, bodies over yours, things like that, you know. So, and I, I just remember that my heart would break for her. It would just hurt her so bad. Uh, I remember uh, him taking me to, I mean, I don't know if this was something that was just, um, that they made me think happened or actually happened because they do both, you know. They can use drugs and different methods to make you think you're somewhere and you're not there. But my memory is, this is my reality in my memory, is that we were at one of the seven hills of Rome. And there was something significant about the seven hills in Rome, but I've never, God's never revealed to me what that is. I probably need to do some research on that. Uh, and so that, you know, there was a, um, I don't know if it was a Pope, a Cardinal, but the, there were some Catholic uh, people that were dressed up like priests, dressed up like the Pope who did sexual things with me. And of course, we know that a lot does go on in the Catholic Church. So, you know, that probably was, you know, high level uh, Catholics that were involved in that. I, I do want to tell you, you, you think, you know, why do they want to do things like that? What is their purpose? Their purpose with me was that they, um, they programmed me to believe that I was possessed of Asherah. Now, that is a demon. Uh, and of course, I wasn't possessed because I couldn't be possessed, especially after nine years old. Nine is when I accepted Christ as my Savior. And you can't be possessed if the Holy Spirit lives in your spirit. But anyway, they, they, they wanted me to believe and they believed. I mean, that's what's so awful about it. These are doctors, lawyers, uh, government people that believe that by having doing sexual things with me, that they were getting power, success, um, financial success through contact with Asherah. So they were wanting to do those things with me to have this supernatural connection with the, the this demon Asherah. Now, was I oppressed by Asherah? Yes, I was. Because in in my, uh, as I talk about my healing, I will talk about how um, she is, was in one of my memories and, um, and how I got set free from that. Um, but anyway, that was, that is what God has shown me. Oh, and also for them to have immortality. They believe that if they have sex with children and the younger you are, the better, that they get immortality. But it's also about power, success, and, you know, moving up in whatever profession they're in or whatever their their goal is. So, uh Going back to 52 and starting to remember all of this, 
um, more and more anger was coming out. I I started having, um, I had some before 52, I would have extreme outbursts of anger with my husband. And my husband is one of the most kind, sweetest men I have ever known. He has never raised his voice at me. I've never heard him say a cuss word. He has never said a harsh word to me. He has never lost his temper with me. He is so much like Jesus. It just amazes me. <laughs> and he was a Memphis police officer. <laughs> Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. He retired from the uh, Memphis Police Department. But I, I would have outbursts of anger with my children, but it was more extreme with my husband. And of course, after I would have the outburst, I would feel so guilty and so sorry, but I could not control it. No matter how many scriptures I, I memorized, no matter how much uh, uh, I, I prayed, if something triggered that anger, it came out and I had no warning and couldn't think through it. I know, you know, you know people teach you, well, well you just got to kind of calm down and think through it. And, you know, think before you speak. When you're triggered as a DI, uh, you know, somebody with dissociative identity disorder, you don't have time to think. That what happened is I had uh, one of my little heroes come out when she thought somebody was saying something that she thought would hurt me. It could be just something simple. And, and to trigger, you know, her anger. And her name was Lee. And uh, she's the, really the first, besides the, the little blonde in the hallway, she was the first altar that I, I, I became aware of when I was 52. And she, she uh, I was standing, standing in my kitchen and I was really struggling and just praying and, and you know, just, uh, you know, lots of depression and just, you know, struggling with a lot of emotional pain. And all of a sudden, I saw this little nine-year-old Faye in my mind. And she had her hands on her hips. And she said, I want to introduce myself. And I thought, oh, my Lord, now I, I, I think I am mentally ill like my mother. I'm schizophrenic. <laughs> this, is, this is crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, my name is Lee. You can call me General Lee. So I knew that she was top cop. <laughs> and uh, I found out later in learning more about DID that you'll usually have like this head guardian over your system. You have a whole, you know, if you're abused as severely as I was, you have a whole system, hundreds, thousands of altars uh, to help you survive, you know, especially when it starts from birth. And um, so she was like the head honcho of my system. And she protected everybody in the system with her anger by, by getting people to back off with her anger. And that's where my outburst would come from. Well, then uh, at, um, you know, I'm continuing to do the Theophostic Prayer Ministry. And uh, then the person who was doing with me uh, moved and quit doing it. And, it. and so I just had to do it just me and God. And one morning I was uh, in my chair doing my quiet time, reading my scriptures and, um, and just praying and crying out to God. Because for six months at this time, for six months, I had um, been stuck in a memory 
of where I had to be married to my grandfather, my biological Freemason grandfather. And so there was a wedding ceremony. And um, at the end of that wedding ceremony, I went down to the bottom of a hill and I had this picture of Satan laying on top of me, holding me down. And I stayed stuck in that memory for six months. And I felt, I mean, physically claustrophobic. And uh, and so, you know, I knew, well, okay, I've got to look around and see Jesus. I've got to find Jesus because Jesus is going to have to rescue me from this. And I looked around. I saw Jesus. Jesus was very tiny. He was like a little toy. He was weak. He couldn't help me. And Satan was more powerful. And somehow through that wedding ceremony, that's the belief. I don't know that my grandfather and the Masons um, uh, knew that I would believe that. I don't think half the stuff, they didn't know what Satan was doing inside of you to get you to believe things that aren't true. I, I don't I don't know that they were aware of that. They just wanted to control you so that you could do whatever assignment they wanted you to do and not resist. So um, I, uh, I, after six months, I go in, into my sunroom and sit in my chair and I'm reading John 14, chapter 14. I think it's chapter 14, where Jesus says, I am in you, you and are in me, and we are in God. Or he said, I am in God, you are in me, and I am in you, or something like that. But it's, you know, that we're all one. And he said, he said, Faye, would you like, no, I'm sorry, I got, I got that. Before he did that, I'm sorry, Emma. Before he did that, I'm reaching my hand out. I'm I'm probably about nine in this memory, but where I married my grandfather. And I reached my hand out to Jesus. I kept reaching my hand out for him to rescue me. Well, that morning, all of a sudden, Jesus came life size in my mind. He yanked me out from under Satan. And he took me on top of this hill. And there's a scripture. I wish I'd looked it up. There's a there's a scripture that takes talks about that he'll take you from the bottom of the mountain and take you up to the top. I'll have to, I know I remember a scripture like that. And he took me up to the top of that hill and he started dancing with me. And he would just twirl me around and dance with me. And, oh, it was so, uh, I, I just, I was just amazed at what he was doing. And then he said, would you like to be integrated today? Would you like to become one with all your little girls? Because they were up on top of the hill watching. And it's so many, I couldn't even count them. It was hundreds of little girls on top of that little, it's just a sea of them. And of course, uh, Lee is in the front. <laughs> She's in the very front. Oh, there was also in this system of altars was Angel. And Angel was the one that handled the, the sexual stuff. She was my se sexual. And so she would handle that for me. And um, so I said, well, yeah. I mean, you know, that, that was one of my goals. My my main goal wasn't to be integrated because I had learned in Theophastic, the main goal is to just walk with the Lord, become closer to him, have a closer relationship, to focus on that because it might take time, you know, for the integration to come and you don't want to keep focused on that. So um, he used that scripture in John 14. And I saw all my little girls start leaping into his arms and going into his chest. 
Well, I was disappointed because I will, I thought they were supposed to leap into me. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, what's going on? You know, uh, I want them to come into me. And he said, well, no, they they need to come into me. And then he, he shared that scripture. I am in you. You are in me. And we are in God. So they were integrating with me, Jesus, and God, and the Holy Spirit all at one time. Oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. It was. So uh, guess what happened when Lee integrated with me? The it. anger I burst went away. I got totally set free from the dissociative anger outburst. Now, do I sometimes get angry? Yes, but it's a normal level. It's manageable. I can think before I speak. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that dissociative uh, uh you know outburst where where i you know had a hard time controlling it so uh a few months later my husband and i are having breakfast he always likes a big breakfast he likes pancakes and waffles and omelets and, <laughs> and so we're having one of his big breakfasts mm. and i said really because I hadn't even noticed it. I said, have you noticed that I haven't gotten angry at you in several months? Because several months was a long time for me not to have an outburst. And he said, yeah, but I wasn't even going to mention it. <laughs> Bless him. <laughs> so I told him, I, I hadn't told him about my experience with Jesus. And I told him what had happened. I said, boy, I think it's gone. I think he knew who Lee was. I had he had met Lee many times. And um, and so we were so grateful. And you know, that Jesus just kept dancing with me. I'm trying to, oh, then I remember the hallway, Emma, with my three-year-old in the room. After that, after the integration. He went into each room and put a throne that glowed like the sun in every room of my heart where there had been altars and filled them up with his, his throne. So, I mean, I experienced the throne, uh, many hundreds of throne rooms in my heart that day. So, uh, Trying to think to where to go next. Do you want to talk, since I interrupted you earlier and I brought you back to Washington, do you want to talk about the programming that you were going to talk about? Okay. All right. Because I think mainly that's what happened in Washington. Now, also, I have memories of George Wallace. Mm -hmm. Those weren't in Washington. Those were in Mississippi where I was programmed. Okay. Most of my programming was in a barn in a Grenada, Mississippi. But some of it, and I forgot to share this on the Shells program, but some of it was done in the basement of a Baptist church. These men were members of a Baptist church, and that has been a problem in the Southern Baptist church. I love the Southern Baptist church. I grew up there. I got my foundation there. I learned so much. And I appreciate all that, but I had bad experiences in the Southern Baptist Church of people um, not wanting to believe me, um, you know, not wanting to talk to me about it, because I got I got to where I was very bold about asking Masons in the church, you know, why would you participate even if you don't? don't know about the 33rd degree and it's in the 33rd degree where you are where they do the trauma-based mind control and that includes the Illuminati the new world order uh, you know all of that scenario they're they're all involved in that even to this day and um so George Wallace was mainly 
uh, in Mississippi because he was like, I looked it up in an, uh, an encyclopedia. Can you believe I'm that old? <laughs> Nobody has encyclopedias anymore. And uh, I didn't have a computer to look it up on. So, uh, and he was an orator for the Masons and he would travel around, uh, uh, you know, speaking at Masonic's meetings. And so, you know, he he got, and I got proof that he also um, was going to Boys Towns and Boys Towns are breeding ground for uh, the, the programming that that's a big you know a place where they go and get boys and program them and so he abused boys at boys towns all over the country but anyway the programming um mostly done in a barn the the worst one two of the worst let's say let me do the two of the worst was when they would put the um the electrodes on my head it was like a a wire cap on my head and it went around my forehead and then there were always these electrodes on my temples and so to program me and of course programming is to get you to dissociate so that you don't remember what's happened so that they don't get in trouble and you know nobody finds out because you can't tell them because you don't remember after you've been through this the other uh, reason for the program is to get control of your will so that you don't have a free will. You don't have a choice but to do what they tell you to do, no matter how horrific it is. Um, another way that they, uh, oh, oh, a third one that was a big one. After my sister was born when I was four years old, they would bring her in as a baby and tell me that they were going to hurt her or kill her. And that, that really got my attention, you know, especially as a preschooler that I could not let that happen. So between those three things, there was also um, cigar, cigar, c cigarette burns. That wasn't nearly as bad as those three things and um, drugs you know, giving you drugs. So um, they, um, they, the spiritual abuse was the worst in the programming. Uh, my grandfather would dress up like God. My dad would dress up like Jesus. And they would lay me on this thing that looks like an altar. And um, this, and my first memories of this is around two or three years old, but mainly at three. I think it started at two, but big time at three. Seems like when I have talked to other su survivors or prayed with other survivors, because I also pray, do inner healing prayer with survivors, um, they also. Uh, that's a key age in their memories is three years old, big time. They keep going back to three, keep going back to three constantly. And uh, so they would, they would shock me and then have me reach my little hand out to Jesus and God and ask God and Jesus to help me and take the pain away and stop the pain. Well, my grandfather and my dad would turn their backs on me and walk away. And the Mason says, see, Jesus and God don't love you. They're not going to help you. You can't trust them. And even though I grew up not knowing that in my head, I, 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 I knew I could trust God. But I didn't experience it in my heart. And so um, then... Eventually, after doing that several times, and I guess they could tell, you know, uh, well, I, I kept refusing, and then they would do it, and then again, because I did not, that there was a goat head above my head, hanging above my head, and I don't know for sure if there, it was Baphomet, but it looked like the pictures I've seen of Baphomet, so I feel pretty sure it was and that's an occult 
symbol, you know, in the satanic stuff. Um, and they would tell me to ask Baphomet to take the pain away. And I kept refusing because I didn't like Baphomet. He was ugly and scary and I didn't like him. So finally, they broke me down and I asked Baphomet to take the pain away. Well, they stopped the electroshock, gave me drugs so that my head wouldn't hurt. And that was the way they controlled me, is to get me to trust Baphomet and then they would know, well, they could get me to do anything. Yeah, the, uh, so often from survivors, you know, that people would dress up or there would be ceremonies. And especially when you're on drugs too. I mean, as yeah. an adult, that would be very confusing. Try to be, you know, for people listening, try to put yourself in your child's mind whenever you're very young, trying to make sense while well, you're on drugs and you see these people in front of you that are telling you that they're, you know, they're God and Jesus turning their back on you, you know, and like you said, the ultimate control of let's torture you until you cry out to the person that we want you to cry out to, not the person that you want to cry out to you, which would right. be Jesus and God. Right. Complete. I, I I don't ever remember not wanting a close a close relationship with God and Jesus. I don't ever remember not being aware of that and wanting it. Even as a three year old at night in my bed when I'd go to bed at night and no tell them what had happened to me, you know, that day or that week, and I, I you know I I did find going to memory where I would be crying in my bed and um and then I would picture G God just laying beside me and holding me and wrapping his arm around me and he and he would say one day this will stop one day this will stop as early as three years old I felt the presence of God how healing and, is that? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So um, so you know, he he drew me close to him, I believe, from birth. He just kept drawing me close to him. He was always there with me. And now when I look at my memories, I have no pain in any of my memories. I only have the presence of Jesus in my memories and the the main uh, the main goal in uh being deprogrammed in inner he healing prayer and and this is the main goal in everybody's life your life Emma everybody's life whatever negative emotions we're having is always based in a belief we be we feel what we believe we're going to feel joy if we believe truth. We're going to feel anxious if we're believing a lie. We're going to feel depressed if we're believing a lie. And we don't even re realize what lies we're believing. You know, we're not trying to believe lies. But from the time we're born, whether we're programmed in this kind of stuff or not, as soon as a person is born, Satan is always there like a roaring lion seeking who he will devour. The only way he can devour us, the only way that he can hurt us is through lies. So he's always looking for an opportunity. Somebody's hurt your feelings. Somebody's done something that scared you. Whatever it is, a parent hasn't loved you enough. What, whatever it is, uh, you've been neglected, you've been abused then Satan immediately puts a lie in that place. Whatever is happening in you from the time you're born all the way through uh, childhood. And then he knows he's got you an adult, that he can create strongholds in your life, addictions, um, sexual immorality, uh, different kinds of sins in our lives because he's already gotten those lies embedded 
from the time we're born and throughout our childhood. So, you know, he thinks I've got you. But he doesn't if we turn to God. And 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 so the key to it, my healing, was to find out what those lies were. Go back to the first memory where I started believing that lie or having the feeling, whatever emotional pain I was in. And then sent, finding Jesus in that memory and asking him to speak his truth to me that he would, you know, uh, speak his truth and that would make the lie go away. And that's when I would get healing. Now that was a difficult process for me because I don't know if the Freemasons knew that, that they were doing this or if, if it was just Satan's work, but I had all kinds of false Jesuses every time I would go to a memory to find out where whatever stronghold or feeling I was having was, you know, uh, causing me problems. Um, and I would ask G, I would look for Jesus and then I would find Jesus and ask him to come closer to me and, um, and ask him, what did he want me to know? I would see a false Jesus who wanted to have sex with me every time. I got so sick and tired of having false Jesuses trying to trick me into believing that they were Jesus. Now, in my head, I knew they weren't. But in that memory and in my heart, they seemed very real. But even though I knew they weren't Jesus, I knew they were a false Jesus. But it was still hard. And so we would have to do a lot of um, asking questions, uh, finding out, um, you know, if I believed that I needed that false Jesus, finding out whatever belief I had that was keeping that false Jesus there. And we'd finally have a breakthrough. And then, you know, I could hear from the true Lord Jesus. But that went on for a real long time. I, I don't know that the Masons even were aware of that. I think that's just Satan's tricks. He He's a trickster. He loves to trick you into believing things that aren't true. Oh, yeah. He'll tell 90% truth, 10% lies, you know, and so very, <laughs> very, very deceptive. Yeah. Now, how did you find out? Because it sounds like initially these were people that once you recalled your memories you associated with being associated to the southern baptist church at which point did the freemason part come in where you realized that these men aren't just baptist church members but they're freemasons also um let me see what point did i realize that okay well you know i had the memory in the uh being programmed in the basement of a Baptist church. And I can still see where that Baptist church is positioned in Grenada, Mississippi, uh, what street it was on and everything. But, you know, I didn't really think about the people in the church being aware. And I don't think the people in the church were aware. Only the Freemasons were aware. Um, as I kept remembering the, about Freemasons, and then you're aware that deacons in your church are Freemasons and Sunday school teachers. That was very disturbing to me because I started doing research because at first I thought, well, this was just one particular group. This isn't all Freemasons. Um, and not all Freemasons, only I've heard only about 80 20% know about the 33rd degree, 15 to 20%. The the other Masons, they don't, they don't know what goes on. They know about the 33rd degree, but they don't know what goes on in it. Um, but you know, I just started connecting the dots. Okay, so I'm I'm researching and I'm learning that at the first degree, they put the compass in square on top of the Bible and pledge to follow Freemasonic 
truth, the Masonic truth, over the truth of the Bible. They make a vow to do that. And these are men in the church doing this. At the second degree, oh, oh they go into the uh, lodge and uh, the head of the lodge is called the worshipful master. And they bow to the worshipful master and pledge to follow him into all truth. So I started asking men in my church, do you really go into your lodge and bow to a man and call him your worshipful master? And one of them said, oh, Faye, that doesn't mean anything. It's just a title. I said, you have got to be kidding me. Mm. That title only belongs to the true Lord Jesus of Nazareth. What is wrong with you? Do you not realize you're practicing her heresy? Emma, people got to where they gave me a wide turn in the Southern Baptist Good. Church. You go, girl. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. We need more people doing that. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just started asking questions and just challenging them and saying, yeah, you know, this is heresy. I can't believe I respect you. I love you as my brother in Christ, but this is heresy. And uh, so, you know, but they, they just believe this lie. Okay, the second degree, and I ask another Mason about this, they do the ritual of uh, Hiram Abiff, and he is an Old Testament uh, character who was a stonemason helped build the, rebuild the temple. And, uh, and so Hiram Abiff is... Um, it's going to be beaten by this, this crowd of people. And, and they act this out. So they role play it. And there are men there. And they come with sticks and stones to beat you. And they say, you know, tell us the secret of Freemasonry. And he, he won't tell them the secrets. And so they stone him. Not really stone him, but they pretend to. And, and he, he dies. And they put him in a coffin. They do a lot of stuff with coffin. Coffins. That's another program. And they used to put me in coffins with snakes. And that was part of my programming. Um, you, you'll do anything to get out of a coffin that has snakes in it crawling around you, crawling on you. They weren't poisonous, but they were like little garter snakes or something like that. And uh, and so they put Hiram Abiff in the coffin. He's dead. And then he rises from the dead. He stands up and everybody raises their hands and they they say, oh, uh, it is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Hiram Abeth that we get to go to the Grand Lodge in the sky. I asked this man in my Sunday school class, I said, tell me you didn't do that. <laughs> he said, Faye, I cannot. I, I've sworn to secrecy. I can't discuss these things with you. I think I can understand why. Right, you're that's coming to church and pretending to be one thing, and you're going to Freemasonry and participating in heresy. It wasn't long before I left that church. Good. There's and then that's not an anomaly. This has become prevalent in our churches. It is very difficult now to find churches that aren't run by a staff full of Freemasons or infiltrated in some way by them. Right. And even if it's not the people, you know, preaching the people you're sitting next to in the pews, you know, like these people are very deceptive. They blend into society and seem very outstanding. I mean, you mentioned your grandfather being a doctor. How uh -huh. is that, that somebody. Yeah, they're intelligent man. Very intelligent, very resourceful, usually have a lot of money and they do have a lot of power, you know, and constantly mm -hmm. more. Right. They're, they're very deceived, intelligent men, but yeah. you don't. And, and it's like I said on Michelle's uh, show, I have compassion for these people. You know, God has healed me enough that all I have, I don't have any anger toward them anymore. Um, I have lots of compassion for my parents and for Freemasons because they could not do these things if some horrible things hadn't happened to them. I, I don't believe they could. It, it's got, 
people who hurt people like that have got to be very wounded, broken people. And I have lots of compassion for that. I'm not making excuses for them. There's no excuse, no matter what has happened to you in your life, to make choices like that. But I do have compassion for whatever they went through that brought them to that place. Well, it's like you were saying with your father, you know, it's something that was done to them and something that they're, if you don't know any better, if you never have somebody step in and actually love you and show you care and show you what a healthy relationship Mm -hmm. is, if all you know from birth is abuse, then you don't know any different. That becomes just how the world is. That's how life is. And again, it's not excusing it because ultimately God does give us free will, right? And there Mm -hmm. are you and like Lisa and Kathy O'Brien and other survivors who got that choice and looked the other way and said, it stops with me. Right. 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 But I think we do as a society, we do need to have compassion because the little girl that you were, that you talk about, that was your father. That was your grandfather. That was all these abusers went through that same horrific life and never had somebody intervene and say, no, I love you and never built a relationship with Jesus and realized how unconditionally loved they are and that they don't have to do horrible things to get approval from their God, lowercase g, you know, that Jesus loves us just because we were born. He died for us, you know, Mm -hmm. he died for us way before any of us were here, you know? And so ultimately, yes, they do. They could choose different. And I do understand that, but they don't know consciously that they have a choice. They've never been able to have a choice. And so I really appreciate that because I hear all the time from survivors. Survivors are the most compassionate and loving people because they see the divinity in everybody. They understand Mm -hmm. they live in a child abuse system and that these are abused children going, growing up to be abused, uh, abusive adults that never healed, Mm -hmm. never had a chance to heal, you know, and my fear is society that, you know, hasn't come to that conclusion. All they want to do is grab their pitchforks and kill everybody, you know, and the problem that we can't kill ourselves out of like this is going to be a group healing where we all have to say how do we heal we need to go inside and heal because if we don't the next generation the generation after that we're just perpetuating it right well it i mean this whole healing process and i hear kathy o'brien talking about you know the scripture and john the truth will set you free yeah and that's what sets us free not only knowing the truth about what happened to us That's very important, but knowing God and Jesus truth and, and that, you know, uh, getting rid of the lies that we're believing that cause us so much emotional pain. Amen to that. Yes. And you're such a beautiful Testament of that being on the other side of it and being able to talk to us all about this. Now, I get I wanted to ask you, going back to the barn, whose barn was that? Was that on a track? I have no idea. I I don't know whose barn. It may have been in one of the Masons on their property. There was a lot of land. It was very rural. I remember that. But um, I don't remember being in a lodge. I remember being a barn. Yeah, and I've heard. I don't know. Yep. I know that there's probably, you know, different places that all of them have to, you know, sort of hide away. And if you're in a rural area, it's a lot easier to find. That's what, you know, Lisa Meister, a lot of her abuse was somewhere, you know, I think some of hers was like in a barn type setting. It was off somewhere that you wouldn't really expect, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, out in the woods, you know, find a remote area like that's great for them. They don't have to be on a, a busy street or a public place. Although I do understand that they, they abused you in a church too, you know, that's yeah. a pretty public place, yeah. but they're yeah. very, very sneaky with how, you know, resourceful they are in finding even locations for doing nefarious yeah. things. Yeah. I've heard testimonies and read that often it's done in a barn. I know Diane, have you ever heard of Diane Hawkins? I she has I- a, she has a big ministry, Restoration and Christ Ministries in North Carolina and uh, hers was done in a, a barn. So there's something about barns. I don't know what it is. Interesting. Um, now for you, what would you like to say to other survivors or Freemasons? What would your message be to people on the other side that are either struggling or they're 
say involved in this and don't really, you know, may not know what it is or may not understand what they're in, you know, getting into, what would you like to tell people from both ends? Well, to the Masons, I want you to know that I've been praying scriptures for you for years since I found out what Masons did to me. I pray over men that are in Freemasonry that God will enlighten the eyes of their hearts and they will realize how deceived they are being and how they are participating in heresy. And actually, when they worship, uh, when they do these vows, and when they uh, call on Gaoto, the grand architect of the universe, that's the, the big G that's on their symbol in the compass and square and on their rings, that is Lucifer. Actually, and you, a lot of you don't realize it, you are worshiping Lucifer because that is the God of Freemasonry. And I just pray for God to reveal that to you and help you to get out of this because it is destroying you and it can destroy your family. And even the, the, the sexual abuse gets contagious. There are so many Masons that sexually pe abuse people in their families. Even if they're not doing what they did to me, there is a stronghold that gets in the brotherhood of this fraternity to where men start struggling with thoughts of pedophilia and child abuse that might not have ever struggled with that until they got into Freemasonry. So you're opening yourself up to Lucifer and his deceits and his tricks to cause you and your family a lot of problems. And I just pray that God will open your eyes, open your ears to his truth and not the lies of Freemasonry. Amen, sister. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. And what would you say to survivors, whether they've gone through what you did or just any other type of abuse that they've survived? Well, I want to encourage them to get on a journey with God. And I know how difficult that, that is. When I was 29 and I want, I, I had been having for years a hard time reading my Bible. Well, since I was 19 years old, but we'll talk about that at another podcast. Uh, and when I started remembering my mother sexually abusing me at 29 years old, I knew I had to get into God's word. It, God just said, Faye, you, you've got to get my truth. Because it, he could, just kept saying, it's the truth that's going to set you free. And you've got to get my word into you. I mean, I had been raised in church. I had learned a lot, but I needed a personal relationship between me and God. And whether I could, you know, read my Bible. Well, to read my Bible, I would start shaking. I would start trembling. I would start fearing that I was going to become mentally ill like my mother because my mother read her Bible constantly. She wrote, read books about the Bible. She was a very religious woman. But then at home, she was doing horrible things. And, it, you know, it scared me. So I could only read maybe five minutes a day. That's how I started. Start somewhere. Get into a Bible study with women who will love on you or men, if it's a man, get in a, a church or a small group. If you can't go into a church, I know it was hard for me to go to church. It seemed like every time I went to church, they sang that, that, uh, that song, God is so good. Oh my gosh. In my head, I knew that. But every time they'd sing that, I would start weeping, crying. I always cried for years going to church. 
<laughs> especially if they saying God is so good, because in my heart that was hurting me because my little girl parts, my altars, God wasn't good to them. And that would hurt my heart. So I, I understand those things. And I want people who are survivors that I, I, do, I do understand that. But I just kept pushing through, pushing through, pushing through, because I knew that God was my only hope. And that's my prayer for you, is that you will realize that no matter the lies that they've gotten you to believe about God that hurt, that, that hurt your heart, those are not true. They are tricks. They're very painful tricks. And I want to say all they are tricks. Well, it's, it's bad tricks. It's, it's tricks that, that were done in horrible ways. But just if you can just start with a, maybe uh, Sarah Young's uh, book. Um, what is, goodness, everybody reads that book. Uh, <laughs> it's a devotion book. Even if you just get a, a, a devotion book that has scriptures, even if you can't hold a Bible in your hand, just start somewhere seeking God in your pain and eventually as time goes on you will get more and more comfortable with a little bit more it's it's kind of like <laughs> uh, I don't know I've, I've heard you know that you have to gradually do some things you can't do it all at one time so you know just start somewhere um, Emma, I know you know this devotion book, but anyway, I can't think of it right now. But it's just little one-page devotions, and it's all about our relationship with God and being thankful. So, and oh, that's another thing to the survivors. Just start thanking it and. And some people can't relate to God, that he's harder to relate to than Jesus. Because Jesus was a man. He, you know, I know my sister said, well, I could relate to Jesus more because, you know, I felt like God abused him by sending him to the cross. He was an abused child, even though she knew in her head that wasn't true. She related to him more. It, but you don't even have, if you're not comfortable with Jesus, just Holy Spirit. Just find one of the Trinity that you can find three things to be thankful for each day. That rearranges the, the things in your brain, all the synapse and whatever it is. It starts changing things in your brain, in your think, think in your thinking. Thankfulness is a huge healing tool. Uh, you don't even have to say it to God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Just speak out some word of being thankful or thanksgiving. I'm thankful for the buttercups that are blooming today. I am thankful for uh, spring, for the dogwoods, it doesn't have to be a big spiritual thing, just something that brings some joy into your life. I love that because it's so applicable. It can be very intimidating, like you said, to just change everything at once. And you're so good at articulating, you know, how to break things into pieces in a sense and start small. You know, it's the same. I always hear mm -hmm. that dieting or working out, you know, you don't have to go work out for a whole hour go walk for five minutes, you know, the next day, walk for seven minutes, the next day, walk for 10. Yeah. Yeah. You can That's do a good that illustration. Yeah, yeah. Until eventually it becomes a habit and something that you grow accustomed to grow a higher tolerance for, you know, grow, uh, just more tolerance in general for. So I love that. That's so helpful. And you do such a beautiful job too. just, you know, talking about taboo things, you know, there's not many people out there, especially in Freemasonry, which I mean, we know why they're deceived and they're under oath, but there's not a lot of people out talking about them. And these are, I mean, I have a lodge, not even a mile from my house. I know you have one in very, very close mm -hmm. proximity, just miles. Like for a lot of us, this is the reality that 
these people are hiding in plain view. They're not hiding, you know, they're not disguising themselves as being somebody else. They're a, an actual facility. They're a business. They're, you know, they're in our communities going to community events. And we're tolerating this as a society. And there's not enough people standing up and saying, no, we need to expose them for who they are and get them away from this. You know, Jesus yeah. is the guy, And these people are, you know, committing crimes against humanity, children, and against themselves and their own families, even if it's not conscious, you know? So right. I really appreciate that you're talking about some of these really hard subjects because it is, it's really hard. And one of the things I wanted to bring up, and we don't have to talk about it a lot. I just wanted to acknowledge it. You had brought up um, in the little biography that you gave me, and you talked a little bit about it on Michelle's show about how the the most scary thing for you and the hardest thing was how they inverted the spirituality part. And then you right. also, you're open with talking about you know, the second hardest thing was the human sacrifice part. Right. And I think a lot of survivors carry a lot of shame about that. And I appreciate that you're open with saying, you know, these are things that happen and we can't beat ourselves up about it. We can't sit here and hate ourselves for it. We have to turn it over to God and we have to have that, that deep relationship with ourselves and recognizing that survivors are forced under mind control to do things that they would never right. conceive of doing in real life, you know, Freemasons, same thing if they're mind controlled. And we just as a society, I think, need to get better at seeing things from both sides, but also having the courage to speak up about things that are taboo, about things that might affect families, you know, if and might affect communities. If we're calling out Freemasons, like that's gonna, it's gonna cause, it's gonna put, you know, a ripple in the ocean. But it's something mm -hmm. that we have to do. We have to get more comfortable having these conversations. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for pioneering that and being a voice for so many children that are still going through it. So many people that have survived it and so many people that are still in it. Faye, it's incredible yeah. to see you here today with that beautiful smile and just on the other side of healing. Yeah. Oh, that devotion book. I remember Jesus okay. Calling. Jesus. It's called okay. Jesus Calling by Sarah Young, and it's written in the perspective of that Jesus is talking to you through the devotion, but it's all based on scripture. And that might be a, and it, it get really encourages you in thankfulness. So I would, I would encourage survivors to get that book, even if they can't read the Bible. And I'll find that book and link it in the show notes so people can go click on it. And before, yeah. we, before we leave for today, speaking of books, I wanted you, I want to put this out there um, because I think it's, it's amazing um, that you're working on a book and I know mm -hmm. it's not out yet, but I just wanted to give you just, you know, a minute or two or however long you wanted to just talk about that. Cause I, I think it'll be something people will look forward to whenever it is ready. Yeah. Well, now in my book, and we can do this on a, another broadcast, I told you about integrating with that system of altars. Well, a few years later, I found out I had a totally different system, a second system. And I, they didn't get integrated with me until five years ago. So anyway, I was just going to throw that in there that, uh, that, you know, we could do another podcast about the second system. Uh, the, well, my book is, uh, stuck right now. <laughs> uh, some people write because they enjoy writing. And I really enjoyed writing the first draft of the manuscript. It was, it was healing and, um, and I enjoyed it. But now that I'm needing to go back and write it to where you have the right punctuations and the paragraphs are right and all that, oh my gosh, I hate it. <laughs> I hate the work, you know, just, just sitting and letting everything flow and write out, you know, what God was showing me to write. That was fun. But now the editing part is a lot of work. And I always tell my husband, I said, you know, I would go out and work, make some extra money, but I don't like to work. 
and and so uh, those of you out there, <laughs> pray for me that I will get back to writing because I haven't written in a while. And but I know that God wants me to finish writing this book, and it's called Becoming Whole, mm-hmm. and it's just my journey of healing, hope, and um, and wholeness uh, through. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And I want them to get all the credit, all the honor, all the glory. And no matter what God, Satan has deceived you to believe about God, oh my goodness, he loves you so much. I can't wait for this book. And it'll be in perfect timing, God's timing. You know, his yeah. timing might not always be our ideal timing, but it's always perfect mm-hmm. whenever we can look back at it. That's so beautiful. And I love seeing people like you, like Lisa, write a book. That's something that most people that have no limitations, you know, don't ever do in their life. And here's you girls, you know, you guys are carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. You're talking about such incredibly hard things from personal experience. It's not a fiction novel that might be Mm -hmm. more fun to make. This is your actual life that you're putting out there. And I commend you for that because that takes such bravery and it is not easy writing a book. It's not even easy being able to pick these stories apart and like find out how do you structure the story? Do you start at the beginning? Do you start in the middle? Do you start at the end? And mm-hmm. then back? Like it's very complex. So I know whenever it comes out, it's going to be perfect and that he will give you the inspiration that you need when the timing is right. Okay, I I need to find some joy in it. Oh, I want to say one other thing to survivors. Sweethearts, God has never disappointed you in you. He is never angry with you. All he has is love. When I realized that, oh my goodness, what freedom I got. I always felt like God was disappointed in me and that he was angry with me if I messed up and he never is. So I want to close with that. (laughs) Uh, Yes, it's, you know, survivors are made to think that you're, in order to be loved by anybody, that it's conditional, that you have to do this, 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 and it's never ending. Right, performance-based, yes. It's hard to you don't have to do anything for for God. You don't have to do not do anything or do anything. He He loves you no matter what. Thank you for that, Faye. I appreciate you, and I really appreciate you coming on and and giving me as just beautiful nuggets and words of wisdom to everybody. If there was somebody listening, and it's okay if if you're not, or if there's not a way, you know, if you don't have an email or anything, but is there any way if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, if they wanted to thank you or contribute to your book somehow, or just, you know, reach out to you in any way, are you on any social media or is there any way that people can get a hold of you? Um, I have a Facebook, but I don't ever use it. Um. I'm a little hesitant. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, you know, because I don't want to get any people uh, trolls, right? That, yeah. So let me think about that, and I'll get back with you. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, because the money issue is a problem. You know, we we my husband is a retired policeman, and even though I got my degree in education. I never could teach school because of the horrible uh, PTSD and the depression. And so, you know, we don't have tons of money and it is, it's very expensive to have a book edited. But anyway, uh, I'll I'll just have to think about that. All right. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to hear from people, but I don't want Satan attacking me through my Facebook. Yes. So what we'll do is we'll just have to have you back on so we can just update okay. people. So I would love to have you back yeah. on. This we'll talk, really that, talk about that more. Okay. Thanks, Emma. And thank you for trusting me with your story. It was really an honor getting to share it. I know you've only done it one other time, you know, in this format. And it's it's really yeah. an honor having you on here. I appreciate you coming on and sharing, Faye. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And for everybody listening, thank you so much for tuning in. We couldn't do this without you. Please share, please comment, please subscribe. Share this with a friend. You know, this is how we spread this and get people on board. I always say you don't have to go post it on your social media if you don't want, but 
If you have a friend that might be open to listening, share Faith's story. That way they can learn these hard truths of the world. You know, that's how we're going to make an impact is one person at a time. Mm -hmm. so I appreciate you guys tuning in. We will be back next week and God bless you.